Residence. Residence. <laughs> residence. So that will actually consider a problem where the word residence truly applies and coincides with our intuitive understanding of residence. So we're going to go back to the harmonic oscillator, and by that I mean u double prime, I'm a mathematician now, plus 9u equals, and we're going to drive it at a frequency that matches its natural frequency. If you remember our discussion of natural frequency, it's the square root of 9 over 1. So it is 3, or, <laughs> or minus 3. But once you put it in the sine and cosine, that distinction goes away. So we're going to drive it. Let's throw a number in. Sine of 3t. This is the classical resonant situation where the frequency of the drive matches the natural frequency of the body, of the system. And just looking ahead a little bit to partial differential equations, you might say, well, what is the natural frequency of a bridge, or your vocal cords, or a glass? Well, that's exactly the question that we will answer, which is kind of nice that it'll be connected to this fundamental phenomenon. That's a very, very interesting question. How do you calculate the fundamental frequency of a body? And we'll do it for a simplified equation, but it will give you a very clear idea of where natural frequencies come from mathematically. Okay? But let's once again say that unless you have a little bit of foresight, you don't see any trouble brewing. Because once again, you have a linear ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients, and you have a function on the right hand side, and you think you'll know what to do in terms of your guess. Here's what you would guess, but I'm not even going to write what you would guess. And if you try, once again, like we did before, sine 3t as your particular solution, hoping that you'll get some multiple of sine of 3t and then you'll adjust the coefficient, of course that will not happen for the same linear algebra reason that your guess would be in the null space, and when you plug in an element of the null space into the operator, you get zero and you're unable to adjust the coefficient. You cannot adjust zero. So what do you do? You do what we learned in the previous problem, and you, you modify your guess to t times sine of 3t. Should we do that? So I've done it many times before, and it fails, and then you realize what you need to do, a small adjustment, but let's do it together, because of course my, my original guess would be t times sine of 3t. So let me do it on the board, you know what to do, you have to find the second derivative, even if it's not used in the equation, then, excuse me, the first derivative, even if it's not used in the equation, then the second derivative, then plug it in and see what you get. So let me do it quietly on the board, and you do it on your own. And do you see it almost worked, but not quite? The good thing that happened is that the two light terms that both have t are cancel each other, and you're left with 6 times cosine 3t. So the one thing that didn't work is that we were hoping for sine, but we got cosine. So that's the one part that didn't work. So what should our initial guess be then? t cosine 3t. So let's do it all again, if you don't mind. I think it's enjoyable. With t cosine 3t. And then it'll work. OK. So previously I would underline them, but now I cross them out for emphasis. 
I just realized that the word emphatic comes from the word emphasis. Yeah. So minus six sine three t. And we were hoping for aiming for two sine three t. So negative one third. Okay. We're going to analyze what happened. Because until now, all of these additional factors of t seemed like algebraic tricks. But now they take on physical meaning. So let's think for a moment what the solution would have looked like if this was any other number. Let's, let me try and sketch what the solution would have looked like if this was sine 30t. So, then the general solution would have been some number, alpha, that's what the general solution would have looked like, where the right hand side, where this 2 determines alpha, it would probably be a small number in this case because of this 30 be something like 2 90th or something like that, maybe 1 tenth, maybe 9 90th, I'm not sure. Plus this null space part where the coefficients are determined by the initial conditions. Well, let's say that the initial conditions were pretty strong. In other words, you pulled it far away and then you gave it, well actually then the velocity doesn't matter. You pulled it far away and let go. So then what we're seeing here because there's a straight plus sign, is a superposition of two solutions. Of this nice big cosine, this would be a large number if you pulled it far enough. So it's something that looks like this. I guess that's all right. With this small, in this case small, but depending on how numbers work out, it may or may not be small in practice. High frequency on top of it. The overall solution would look like this. Yeah, so that's kind of what happens. And this shows you the stubbornness of the natural frequency. So you're looking at your mass on a spring, and you want it to go back real fast. So you give it a very, a drive a very high frequency. And it acknowledges it a little bit, but then it still does its own thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this natural frequency is very stubborn. And this kind of speaks to the fact that no matter what you do to a guitar string, no matter how you pluck it, the fundamental pitch will be the same. Yes, other overtones and all of those things matter, and when you use a pick on the guitar, it sounds very different, and if you grow nails, or if you strum versus a soft, whatever you call it, Right? So the temper, how it, you know, how it sounds, the tone, very much depends on how you pluck it. But the fundamental pitch does not. So objects with a natural frequency are very stubborn. It's, they will oscillate with their natural frequency. Okay, so that's this. And mathematically, it will go to perpetuity. Now, when the resonant, when the drive is resonant, Let's think about what the solution looks like. Well, the, the general solution is on the board, and you quickly realize that this term will come, will come to dominate the whole solution. These are sines and cosines. They stay between minus 1 and 1. But this grows uncontrollably, really. So even if we start with the sprig completely at rest, no displacement, no velocity, so both this and this are zero. The solution will look like a cosine. The fact that it's minus a third won't really change the my schematic. That grows in amplitude at the rate of t. So you will see this envelope. So I'm going to use the perfect word. And it will just go like this. Yes. Sorry? Well, it should start at minus one-third. 
Oh, it starts at zero. zero. Dog times t. I thought I was being very clever that recognizing the cosine is, does not start at zero, but no, you're exactly right. What do I do? And of course, these are mismatched in scale because this period should be the same as this. Does that make sense? I just wanted to put a few wiggles, a few wiggles in there. So in physics terms, yes, that's asking the question. Well, you just look at where the maxima hit. So, let me, where am I looking? I'm looking right here. So the maxima will occur wherever a minimum, wherever this part is one, right, these tips. So, uh, or near maxima. You know, I think this probably skews it from being this point to being this point. I have to think about it, but roughly. So the envelope is basically one third T. That's the straight line that's the envelope and minus one thirteen. So these two lines. So this slope is one third. The slope. That's what this is. The tangent of the angle. So physically speaking, what this indicates is that your amplitude is growing. Isn't that exactly what we associate with resonance? Something hits the resonant frequency in other words, the natural frequency of the body, and we just see the oscillations grow. And that's what happens to a bridge when a band matches, oh, marches over it. If the frequency of the march matches one of the natural frequencies of a bridge, that frequency becomes quote-unquote activated. Just like here, the natural frequency became activated. We said the mass is initially at rest and not displaced. And it's only the drive that stirs it up. And it activates this correct frequency. And not only does it activate, its amplitude continues to grow. And that's what happens on the bridge. First it's small, then it's larger, then it's larger, and then it becomes large enough that the bridge collapses. The same thing, thing is what happened in that famous video of a bridge doing this and then eventually collapsing, one of the great failures in engineering. Maybe very, very unlucky. What happened there, from what I know, is this bridge was built in a valley surrounded by a mountain range. And we will learn later on when we study PDEs that it's these characteristic dimensions that dictate, among other things, that dictate what the natural frequency of a system is. And because of the dimensions that were present of the mountain ridge, the frequency of the wind was uh, a certain number. And so the winds that were passing through, uh, that were occurring in that space, had a certain frequency associated with them. And that, fre and that frequency matched one of the natural frequencies of the bridge from the, from the a video that's available, it looks like it was the frequency that did this. All bridges do this a little bit. It had a certain characteristic frequency. And if that happens to match the frequency of the wind, like basically the valley, the mountain range was going up at the bridge. Right? It activated that frequency and eventually the amplitude became so high that the bridge could no longer sustain it. That's that's resonance. I'm trying to put an emphatic exclamation point on that's resonance. When you sing a B flat at a glass, the glass begins to vibrate. You know that phenomenon. You know people playing glasses, wine glasses? What's the resonance there? The resonance there, in my understanding, if, if I'm wrong, I'll be very happy to learn that. But as you move, do you know what I'm talking about? Those musicians who rub their gla wine glasses like this? and glasses are filled with water, all different heights. So when you're rubbing your finger on the glass, there's a little bit of friction. So instead of going smoothly, your finger keeps slipping. It goes slip, 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 like a bow on a violin. And that has a certain frequency. And if that frequency matches the frequency of the glass, and the frequency of the glass is dictated by its material properties, its shape, and very importantly, how much water is in it. So we'll see all of these things in PDEs. And when the match occurs, 
the glass begins to make a sound. That's my understanding of that phenomenon. Uh, what's another example? When you sing at a glass, the same thing happens. You hit one of the natural frequency of the glass, it begins to vibrate, and, and if there's already a fracture in the glass somewhere, that at some point the amplitude of the resulting oscillations will be great enough that that intrinsic fault in the glass, in the structure of the glass, will no longer be able to sustain the vibrations and the glass breaks. Not as spectacularly as it does in movies, but pretty spectacularly. Now, all right, that's resonance. 